All right, now it's ready. Welcome, welcome to Flatsec Jackson. Uh, today's gonna be an exciting day. Uh, how many people have never been to a Mindsec meeting before? Oh, wow. Welcome. That. That's awesome. So Mindsec in general is just kind of a group to get together, talk about security topics. Um, if you want to present about a topic, let us know and we can try and figure out so you can kind of practice presenting and also give some cool info to people. Uh, so uh, we'll have today's agenda, basically. We'll walk through. Our Spring Arbor representative will give a little spiel about Spring Arbor since they have allowed us to use this room, which is very kind of them. Um, then we have a couple announcements, and then our speaker, and then we'll wrap things up. So first off, Mark. Thank you. Welcome. Wanted to say we appreciate you being here to hang out. Um, we're glad that the facility was available for you. Uh, I don't know about next month, but if you guys continue to grow, but uh, we'll, of course, communicate with you guys. Um, well, actually, he'll communicate with me and say, Mark, we are very good. Goodbye. <laughs> so, okay, well, we tried. Um, we, um, we have here at the Jackson site for Spring Arbor University what we call bachelor degree completion programs. Um, people who have not necessarily finished their bachelor's or maybe they finished an associate. Uh, we have a bachelor in business, we have a bachelor in organizational development, which is really good for supervisors, managers type. Um, we also have an MBA if you've already pre, uh, finished your bachelor's degree. Um, there are brochures back there um, as, long, as well as my business cards um, just to let you know the different things that we have going on here. Um, all of our programs at our Jackson site are one night a week. So, I mean, you're busy, you're working, you've got families, you know, you don't have the time to do all that study. So all of our programs are very uh, workable and manageable around the work professional. Um, you won't find um, a lot of very young people, I got to quote that, right? You're not going to see a lot of 18, 19 year olds around here. Most of the people are going to be in their late 20s, 30s, and 40s who are going back to finish their bachelor's degree. So, does that make sense? So, um, we don't um, follow the same things that they do at main campus. I know a lot of people are like, well, that's a Christian university, you have to go to chapel. No, you don't have to go to chapel here. Um, you don't have to go to an international program or anything like that. It's mainly about you and what we can do to help you finish the bachelor's degree. Um, if you know anybody who's wanting to connect with me, again, my cards are there. Um, our information is out on arbor.edu forward slash Jackson. Um, and we have sites all over Michigan. So some of you aren't from the Jackson area. Um, if you did arbor.edu forward slash Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, Lansing, Grand Rapids, Traverse City, Flint, Toledo. Uh, we're all over Michigan. We're one SAU. So, again, thank you for letting me talk. I appreciate it. Thank so you for letting us be here. Yeah, no problem. Enjoy the evening. So, first announcement coming up is the MySec Southfield meetup will be happening this Thursday at what time? 7 p.m. 7 at the new location. At the new location, which is. Somewhere. On the meshcheck.org website or in the newsletter, we'll cover that. Couple They've got an incredible speaker lined up. Uh, his name's Owen. <laughs> oh, he's right there. He'll be speaking on incident management. Um, also, at the the last Tuesday this month, we'll be having our Jackson social, where we basically just come out, hang out at Nightlight Bar, and chit chat and talk security. Pretty easy. Then. Uh, also coming up uh, in July, but it's time to start talking about it now, is Converge in B-Sides Detroit. It will be, I believe, the, it's the third weekend or second weekend in uh, July. So it's the week of the MySec meetup that week. So we'll have MySec meetup and then Converge will be Thursday, Friday, and B-Sides Detroit will be Saturday. Converge is a paid conference. Uh, B-Sides Detroit is free. We're looking for speakers, for volunteers. For people for Kate over there to boss around all weekend, um, we're looking for you know any general help or if you have a Twitter account or you know people who want to come, um, you know we're more than welcome. If you have questions or stuff, come talk to me. I'm one of the organizers, so do that. So we can talk about lightning talks. You want me to do that? Yeah, I'll share one. Um, so because Kyle and I will be extremely busy the week of besides Detroit and Converge with the conference, we're going to do lightning talks. So. You haven't never spoke, or you want you have something that maybe you can cover in 10 to 15 minutes, and we'll do a couple of them. 
uh, let us know. So this is like the only night of the year that we have like a free speaking slot. Mm -hmm. So if you have an idea you want to share or bounce off the group, uh, just let Kyle and I know and we'll uh, get you on the schedule for lightning talk. So don't have to, you know, don't feel stage fright. It's not like an hour talk or whatever. Yeah. But a couple 10, minutes. 15 minutes is all you need and then just go. And then everyone does this and then talks to you about your stuff afterwards because that some of the best talks I've seen are lightning talks. So. That should be a lot of fun in July. Otherwise, our speaker this month, Owen Kerr, will be talking about the strategic shift in information security. And with that, I'm pretty much on this next month, which is going to be our next month speaker, which is Steve Motz, speaking on, excuse me while I burp. It'll be an introduction to Burp Suite. So we'll have more information coming out in the news. Are you guys all in the newsletter? Or no, I'm not in the newsletter. It's my mom. <laughs> uh, is this Don? Doing good. Hold on one second. <laughs> All right, speaking of uh, the newsletter and other stuff, so you can get more information um, and various job opportunities and other stuff if you follow MySec on Twitter or do the hashtag um, MySec. There'll be there are multiple events that are always running around. You're on IRC, it's MySec on there. You can talk to people, sometimes security, most of the time not. Um, there's a website that uh, also holds all the event information, stuff like that, that you can get up. But there's also a link to sign up for the newsletter, so you'll get information about us, some of the other security groups in the area, uh, besides Detroit and Converge, as that comes up. But if you go to missec.org on the right-hand side, there'll be a sign up for the newsletter button. Click that, and we promise to spam you. So. <laughs> all right. Cool. There you go. Let's see if this will work. Should I get adventurous and try the HDMI or? Yes. Hey, look at that. Still working? No. All right. Patience is appreciated. Oh, what happened there? <laughs> um, hello. Who's that? It's a series of tubes, isn't it? Come on. I don't know why you did that. Well, that's awfully small. Does it do anything more than 1024 by 768? <laughs> No, I hate bloody stupid. 
touch pads. Does it do anything more than that? Or is that the 1024 by 768's it? We'll do more. Let's try more. All right. That should work. Oh my gosh, it's working. All right. So let's try and get started. Okay. Your generic background. Um, <laughs> all right. So this is a strategic shift in information security. Um, I'm going to be talking about applying some contemporary military thinking or strategies to information security. Let's see if my button works here. Hey, look at that. All right. So who am I? These are the obligatory slides. So I'm Owen. Um, I've been playing around with computers for about 25, 30 years or so, depending on whether you want to consider being paid or not. Um, I've spent 15 years in information security, um, and I've had the opportunity to work for some rather diverse organizations in all kinds of different places and different markets, and I've done all kinds of different things. Um, the last six years, I've spent doing incident management forensics, and I am fluent in alphabet soup, so I know NIST, PCI, HIPAA, GLBA, SOX, NERC, PIC, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So, all right. And um, started up my own consulting firm, so I do digital forensics, incident response, incident readiness, and incident training. So that's all the boring stuff. So let's get started. So I was going to talk about <clears throat> the, on my agenda, whatnot. Um, so I was going to talk about three basic, real big <laughs> things. Um, really start with defense in depth. That's generally what we're all doing. You put lots of stuff in place um, and make it all uh, keep the bad guys out. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the new reality we find ourselves in and then a new strategy or the new strategies that you can use to deal with some of this stuff. So defense in depth, you know, it's your old standard, you know, you build your castle with your wall and your moats and kind of idea. It's sort of reminiscent of like Renaissance thinking. Um, so some of you who um, may go back as far as I do, when it all started, you know, we just hook our networks to the internet and we discovered bad guys had come walking in. So what did we do? We put firewalls in place to keep the bad guys out. Well, that wasn't quite adequate enough. We started putting antivirus in place, then, you know, they would start exploiting instead of level three attacks, they'd start doing level seven attacks, so attacking our applications, they'd be attacking the default services that you'd have in place on some of these systems poor configurations, those sorts of things. So then we invented IDSs and IPSs to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Um, and so they moved on. We've put you know, email gateways in place. We now have patch management. We've got web application firewalls because our developers can't develop secure web apps. And you know, because people like to send all of our intellectual property and whatnot out the door, we now have uh, data loss prevention solutions in place. So it's layers upon layers upon layers. I kind of refer to it as um, budget in depth, right? Vendors love you because you buy lots of boxes, you put them in place, and things are really wonderful for them. So it fails. And so I'm going to talk about some of the failures by the numbers. Part of the problem is we're using pattern matching for a model of detection. So we have low detection rates. We only find known attacks. So if somebody comes up with something new, your signatures on your IDS or your uh, your uh, antivirus, whatnot, they don't see them. Um, we suffer from slow signature turns. So new malware comes out. It takes your vendor a month, six weeks to come out with a new signature. Um, we also have the problem, especially within IDS and IPS, of high false positives. So they scream that the house is on fire and really nothing's going on. And we get poor performance from them. 
And so some of the problems are with the, the defense in depth approach is that there's an assumption that there's an inside and an outside to your network. There is no inside and outside to your network anymore. Bring your own device killed that. You've got employees, they bring their own laptop in from home, they plug it into your network. I kind of refer to it as bring your own disease, all right? <laughs> you know, mom takes her laptop home, junior's on it playing, you know, doing whatever, loading up all kinds of horrible things that they don't realize that they're doing. Mm -hmm. They bring it back into your network and now you've got a huge problem of, of all this nastiness wandering around your network and causing you problems. The other issue with defense in depth is that there's an assumption made that each layer that you add magnifies um, or there's a magnification um, within each layer. So if you think about it, you put a firewall in place and you say, all right, you know, this is going to stop, um, you know, it's going to have a failure rate of like one in 100. So out of 100 attacks, one gets through. Well, that one attack got through. So now I'm going to put an IDS behind it. And that one should catch one in a hundred. So you're making the assumption then by putting these two layers in place that now you've got a one in 1,000 um, failure rate of, of the controls that you've put in place. And, and that's not necessarily true. Um, and some of the things that really highlight this, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Mandiant. Um, they do actually do some pretty good work. They're some pretty smart guys. Um, I've gotten to know some of them. Um, so they're just coming out with their new 2014 report, but in the 2013 report, some of the things they found were 95% of the organizations that they helped were compromised. On average, it took those organizations 243 days to figure out that they've been compromised. 60% of these people or these organizations were informed they were compromised by somebody outside their organization. So they get a call from Bob, hey, guess what? You've got a problem in your network. 100% um, of these organizations had up-to-date antivirus. Um, some of the incidents they handled, they, they collected these things over, over the year. They had 124,000 unique malware samples. 75% of those were only seen once. And only 18% of those 124,000 malware samples were detected by antivirus after 30 days. So they've been out there for a while and your antivirus vendor still not handling them. The other issue that they're finding is um, there's a wonderful service out there called Virus Total. So these malicious actors, they come up with some new stuff. They submit it to Virus Total. Hey, look, nobody catches it. Perfect. I can use this on you. So it's wonderful stuff. So new reality, right? We're building castles. Well, you know what? Our adversaries, they're driving tanks. So your castle doesn't really help you anymore. And really the new reality is it's not a matter of when or if you get hacked, it's a matter of when. So you are going to get breached. You either are breached or you just don't know it is kind of the new ugly reality to deal with. And some of this is that we've got a lot of more um, motivated actors, especially if you're in the manufacturing industry. Um, news is another big area that they, they love to hit. So you get some of these nation state or highly motivated actors, you have something of value. They're not these, the folks I'm talking about, they don't care about your credit card. They don't care about your bank account. They're going to steal the plans to your new device that you're going to come out to market with that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, not just 50 bucks or I can run your credit card up $5,000. And the strategy they're using, it's an old, old term from um, some Chinese, I'm not going to quote Sun Tzu, but the strategy they call is lotus blossom. So you grow inside your adversary's network, basically. And the way they do this, it's basically, you know, they're spear phishing people. So they're actually subverting somebody inside your network to get these things to, to expand their influence. So let's talk about some of the new trends that are coming out. So some of these new strategies, people are now using 
um, or have adapted some of the contemporary military thinking around how to deal with this. So our defense in depth strategy, this is old Renaissance kind of thinking, let's build castles everywhere, we'll have knights ride out and all those sorts of things. Our US military discovered that that isn't a very effective strategy in the new, new era. So they've started using some different strategies and I'll talk about those. So really this is talking, this is basically these new strategies are moving from the idea of filtering and guarding to hunting and killing. So the, the five things I'm gonna talk about is operational security or OPSEC, um, the kill chain, terrain and plane, um, doing intelligence, and then OODA loops. So OPSEC. Um, it's a systematic method used to identify, control, and protect critical information. Um, the purpose is to reduce the vulnerability of your forces or a force from successful or a successful adversary from exploiting critical information. And it applies to all activities that prepare, sustain, or employ forces. So what information is available that an adversary can use against you and how you can limit the availability of that information. So that's kind of the general military strategy that they're talking about. So how can you use this in, in your world? So you look at it from two positions. So that your adversaries, your attackers, they're concerned about maintaining that they're actually attacking you, that an operation is, is occurring. Um, information about what they're interested in attacking you over and their identity. So those are the things that they're trying to keep you from discovering. As a defender, the things you need to worry about are um, material for spear phishing attacks. So it's well known now that if they're interested in your organization, they'll go out to Twitter, they'll go out to LinkedIn and they'll start vacuuming up all this information about who's in your organization, what positions they hold, um, if their LinkedIn um, profiles, a lot of people will put in stuff like, you know, hey, I'm really great at next-gen uh, next gen firewalls from Cisco. So then they'll start making assumptions about some of the technologies you'll have in-house. Um, so the way to deal with this is you want to identify um, the critical information. So what are you trying to protect? So information about your network, information about your people. Um, do some analysis around the threats. So who's actually gonna try and get to this information? Um, take a look at you, uh, do analysis over the vulnerabilities to this information. So how would they actually try and get at it? It's really difficult for you to handle uh, or deal with folks who put stuff out on LinkedIn. Um, sales reps and marketing folks are really good at leaking stuff. Dude, I got this really great new product. You're gonna wanna buy it from me. It does all these wonderful things. Um, so they're a huge source of leaks. You need to do an assessment of the risks. So this is basically a threat times vulnerability type simple solution. Um, so what are you willing to accept for your threats basically is what it boils down to. And then the last step is to apply some appropriate countermeasures. So if you have somebody who's maybe a little too blabby about what it is you have or what it is they do within your network you don't feel as um, or you don't have comfort with um, you might want to go and talk with them about maybe changing their linkedin profile um, those sorts of things so plug your holes all right the next idea that a lot of folks are adapting um, from military strategy is the kill chain um, there's several different examples the one i'm using is actually from the air force um, they developed it in the late 1990s, and it's really the basic steps to require or required to attack a target. So find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess. Find is you de the detection of an emerging target. Fix is positively identify the target as worthy of engagement. Track is as you think it is. Follow that target through its location and whatnot. Um, Target takes an identified, classified, located, and prioritized target, determines the desired effect and targeting solution against it, engages, you know, launch that missile, shoot at it, whatnot, those sorts of things. And then assess is, you know, how much damage did we do to it? Did we have the uh, desired effect? 
So that's the military side of it. Um, in 2011, Lockheed Martin came out with kind of the seminal paper that everybody started chasing after called the cyber kill chain. And they actually have, what is it, seven steps that they determined. So they're looking at it from your attacker's perspective. You're the defender. What are the steps that your attacker actually has to go through to actually get into your network, compromise one of your systems, and start taking stuff from you? So the seven or five steps are reconnaissance, weaponized, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and actions and objectives. Um, as I was talking about in OPSEC, reconnaissance is, you know, not only will they be scanning your network looking for your egress and ingress points to your network, but also information about employees and whatnot that they can use to try and, and spearfish them. Um, weaponization, this is when they actually take um, a known vulnerability that they've discovered that you actually have and weaponize it. Delivery, so they throw the, the, the sorry, the uh, phishing email at you or they actually uh, attempt to break into one of your systems. Um, in, the exploitation is the exploitation of the vulnerability. Obviously, installation is getting the malware on the asset. Command and control. Um, typically, what it happens is the way the majority of us have our network set up is um, systems inside the network can create connections without much difficulty going outbound. They use that to their advantage. So they actually cause your system to create a channel going outbound, which is typically allowed um, if they try and create a channel initi initiated from outside in, it's a lot more difficult. Um, so that's the command and control channel they set up. And then after they get control of a system, they go after what they're after. So typically they'll um, pivot off a host, expand their influence into more of your network and start gobbling up the data that they want from you. So whether it's emails, new plans, those sorts of things. Um, several folks have done more work on this. They've decided that, you know, seven steps wasn't enough. So they decided to come out with, what is it, 12 now? So it, it's just a little more fine grained um, idea, a little more refined. I'm not going to go over all the wonderful little steps there, but. So the next idea is terrain and plane. So this is basically the within the military doctrine, it's the collection, analysis, evaluation, and interpretation of geographic information. Um, so those uh, natural and man-made features um, that can be used um, to your advantage. So you think about the old saying, you know, the adversary that has the higher ground wins typically, or they have an advantage. So it, it runs along those sorts of ideas. So when you apply this to the, I, I hate the term, the cyber world, but I, I guess it applies here. Um, you start thinking about instead of physical terrain and roads and physical buildings and whatnot, these are the, the cyber terrain is made up of the systems, devices, protocols, data, software, processes, cyber personas, and other networked entities that uh, comprise, supervise, and control your cyberspace, right? So it's all those things from the electricity on up to the guys running your boxes. A um, couple different layers to it that they, that they break out with this idea. The supervisory, these are the command and control folks, so your managers, your directors. The cyber personas, these are your accounts your domain admins, your personal email accounts, those sorts of things. Um, the logical layer uh, that they look at within terrain and plane is layers three through seven in the OSI network stack. So from IP address all the way up to application layer. Physical layer is your layer one, so all your, your network wires running around. And then the geographic layers included, which is uh, whether you have one office location or multiple locations. So they talk about when you're dealing with terrain and plane issues, um, looking for uh, 
it's O C O C A. I don't even know how to pronounce that, but it's observation in fields of fire, cover and concealment, obstacles, key terrain, and avenues of approach. And the wonderful thing about within the cyber world, you control all of those things. This is a the the cyber geography, I guess, for lack of a better term, is something that you can dictate. You can control where the egress and ingress points are to your network. You can control um, what can be hidden. You can booby trap your network. So some of the ideas that um, I try and convey are some of the wonderful things you can do is um, stand up a box, like a, a, a honey net box or something, and you could call it something as simple as super secret documents, you know, class four secured, nobody enter here, right? And you have nothing on it. But you have your system set up so that anyone trying to access that system sets off an alarm. There's nothing on it, but your outside adversaries don't know that. Um, another idea is to actually create some fake uh, domain admin accounts. So they look like domain admin accounts, they smell like domain admin accounts, they might even behave like domain admin accounts, but nobody ever uses them. So if somebody tries to log in using one of those accounts, tries to crack one, or tries to move around your network using one, you know you've got a problem. So there's actually things that you can do to booby trap these. Um, the other advantages with terrain and plane is when you have an adversary within your network, you can actually shift the terrain underneath their feet. You can make changes to it that confuse them, um, set them off balance. So the issue is, you know, your attackers are often operating with imperfect information, um, and you create the environment that they operate within. So shift the terrain. All right. Intelligence lifecycle. This is, uh, you know, another another big issue. There's lots of vendors out there now that are providing cyber intelligence. Um, it's all based off of the same kind of military concept. Several steps to to put some intelligence together. So typically, um, when you're dealing with a, a military style operation, you'll get some kind of uh, uh, an intelligence organization will get some kind of command from. A supervisory type position uh, they want some kind of information about somebody so that's the planning and direct direction um, the collection is actually going out and gathering up those sorts of things so breaking into somebody's office and stealing files or whatever if you think about you know the James Bond types or whatnot um, but after you collect up all this information you actually have to do some kind of processing with it you need to make sense out of it it needs to be correlated. You need to kind of wrap some kind of intel, uh, thought processes around it. What does this stuff actually mean? Um, that's the analysis and production portion of it is where you're looking at it. And then you actually produce some kind of report about it um, to your superiors or whoever else needs to receive it. And, and when you send it out, you disseminate it. That's the dissemination and integration portion of it. And wrapped around all of that is an evaluation. So is the stuff we collected valuable? Did we actually analyze it correctly? Did we get it to the right people? Is it actually creating any kind of value for us? So that's the, the military side of it. When it comes to the cyber world, um, a gentleman came out with this, David Bianco. He calls it his pyramid of pain. So as you move up the pyramid, um, these things get a li little more difficult to obtain, but they are a lot more valuable for you. So um, hash values of malicious software, they're trivial to obtain. You find somebody's broken into your system, they leave some code laying around, you can hash it, real easy to find. I IP addresses they're attacking are a lot more simple. Um, domain names, moving up the, the list. The hardest stuff, the TP. TTPs. These are your. Have my notes. I hit the wrong button. There we go. I want to scroll my notes down. Not 
All right, here we go. TTP, tactics, techniques, and procedures. If you can figure out your adversary's tactics, techniques, and procedures, you're way ahead. So you'll know how they're going to attack you, how they go about doing it, what sorts of things they're going to use. So when my adversaries were going to attack me, they typically fish a secretary. They drop, some, uh, drop a loader on our machine, which pulls down some malware. They get their command and control channel going. They start spreading their influence. I know they're using these certain tools. Um, so we can look for them. I know they typically come from these types of places, those sorts of things. So your whole goal is to go after the very top of it. Um, but it takes a lot more effort, a lot more information to get there. Okay, next one is OODA loops. Um, OODA loops is a concept from uh, Colonel John Boyd of the U.S. Air Force. He developed this back in the Korean War. Um, it sounds like a lot of complicated stuff, but really it's the decision process that everybody goes through. Whether you're playing chess, deciding um, how to drive your car, um, anything along those lines, you're actually, it's a concept he developed to describe your thought processes. So the four pieces that make up OODA loops, your thought process are you observe, orient, decide, and act. The idea is that observed decisions are based on observations of an evolving situation. Orient um, shapes the way we observe, decide, and then act. Orientation basically means the separation of the wheat from the chaff. So what's signal, what's noise, um, especially when you're dealing with like IDS systems that scream bloody murder at you. Um, you have to, the orient process is actually getting rid of some of that chaff out of there. Then a decision is need, to, need needs to be made, what you want to do, and then some kind of action. How do you apply that within the cyber world? The whole idea is when you have an attacker, if you can cycle through your OODA loops faster than they can, um, you win. It happens in chess, it happens in um, fighter pilots, Whoever can process their OODA loops faster wins. So there's certain things you can do to actually make that happen. One of the biggest ones is actually providing the people on the front line the authority to actually make decisions. If you have folks there within your SOC, they see alerts come in from their IDSs, they see an adversary in their network, they see something bad going on, and then they have to wait to hear back from a vice president on what it is exactly that they're allowed to do about this, your adversary is going to win. So they do need, you know, when you're dealing with this type of issue, um, they do need to be uh, provided the authority or enough authority to actually be able to make the appropriate decisions and then be able to act. And that's really what the whole thing boils down to. I've got a lot of fancy verbiage in here about how to deal with your orientation, but that's really the whole concept and the whole process behind OODA loops is whoever cycles fastest wins. And that's basically my simple little presentation. Um, questions? Yeah. Yes. So, so how do you um, deal with OPSEC? Yep. How, do you, how, does, how does security groups like this, I mean, you come in and you talk about snort or something like that, so you know, I know when you bring snort in your network, or you, uh, you know, you're talking with your peers about technology, you work with them on a daily basis, is that, how do you, how do you balance that? Well, it depends on whether you're discussing those things publicly or privately. Um, you know, you can go out and you find my LinkedIn profile. Um, and you, you'll see a lot of the things that I've done, but you won't really see any of the technologies really that I've used. Um, kind of the same idea there um, when you're dealing with some of your colleagues. Typically in the organizations I've been in the past, when we have discussions, we have them within private chat channels that are all um, uh, encrypted so that we can handle, you know, handle those sorts of things. It's, it's, a really difficult problem to wrap your hands around because there are portions of your business it's their job to communicate with the outside world um, and they feel that the more they communicate the better off that they'll do um, so then they end up 
maybe divulging a little bit too much information to the outside world. The other concern you have to have is once you have an adversary in your network, um, what kind of secure channels do you have um, to deal with communicating um, and not allowing that adversary to figure out that you know that they're in there, right? If they get into your they get into your mail server and they're reading everyone's email and you're sending email back and forth, you know, I think we've been compromised. It looks like there's a guy in here. Um, they'll know and then they can adapt and change their their behavior um, or delete some of your emails. Hey, I just found them over in the server. No, no one else knows that now. Your email's gone. Um, so those are some of the things you can think about. So we have a question from the RC. Um, yep. If you could sum up the shift in InfoSec in just a couple of sentences, what do you think the, like the summary would be? The summary? Um, yeah, I, I kind of left that off. So the summary would be um, defense in depth is dead. Um, deal, uh, running with um, basically signature based defenses is kind of dead. Um, it's more of a hunt and kill game. You have to make the assumption that there's somebody in your network, um, and so you have to be able to find them faster than they're able to um, you know, steal what it is they're after or destroy what they're after. Um, that's where the, the kill chain comes in. So if you think about the process they have to go through to get into your network, to exploit something and to extract it, there are positions within the kill chain that you can target your activities and your technologies at. So kind of have to shift your thinking away from I build a big wall, I've got one door in it, and I've got a moat around it, and nobody can get in there in. So you have to do the you have to shift from kind of a, a you know a Renaissance era thought process to more of uh, I guess really within the military realm. It started happening around the Vietnam era where we started having we were dealing with guerrilla tactics. Um, and so we started using guerrilla tactics against them as well. So we had hunter killer teams. I don't know if they gave you a response back. That explains it well enough. But. They seem after them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, kind of bouncing off the mandate report, you said what 95% of the companies were compromised? Uh, yeah. Roughly. Roughly, yeah. Um, the thing is, a lot of times people think, oh, it's just Charlie's in my company, but you know, Charlie, Alex, and Bob. And so you have all of these guys with their hands in your network, and do you just systematically deal with them, or uh, I don't know where they're going with this question, but how do you, how do you triage? Um, that's Thursday night stock, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, there's, when you're dealing, you're talking more kind of incident response, so you've discovered something bad's going on in your yeah, network, and, you, and you how just, do you deal with this sort of thing? You one person's in there, or, you know, right. one bad guy, and it's 20 bad guys, yeah. and it's 243 days, because if there's an exploit, you know, something on your Joomla, mm -hmm. I'm sure more than one person's going to discover it, and now, you know, Everybody's in there. So you think, oh, I took care of this guy. And then he finds out two days later, yeah. oh, there's someone else in here and someone else in here. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're not dealing with uh, uh, security, but signature based security anymore. It's, it's uh, what do you say, uh, find and kill or something like yeah, that. Yeah, hunt and kill. Hunt and yeah. kill. That's a, yeah. that's a lot. That's Elmer Fudd, you know, for <laughs> Yeah. Um, so when I was dealing with, with incidents of, uh, of that type, um, typically, it, I wasn't going after the, you know, <clears throat> I'd get a phone call, hey, this system's been compromised, so we'd go and take a look at it, and it would turn out to be, you know, like you said, a Joomla exploit or maybe SQL injection or something like that. Um, so one of the first things we would do is we'd actually, um, we'd do a, um, typically we were um, scanning our environment pretty regularly with vulnerability scanners. If that system hadn't been scanned recently, we'd have it scanned immediately. Um, and the idea there was, I know there's at least one issue with this system. I don't want to come back in two weeks and deal with it again. So 
we're going to take the report from the vulnerability scanner and we're going to provide that to the business as well and give them a whole list of these are all the things that need to be patched these are all the weaknesses we found in your code those sorts of things so not only a vulnerability scanner but if there's any custom code on it we pull that as well and run that through um, i think at the time we were using app scan so we'd look at the custom code and we'd look at the the you know known vulnerabilities we're using qualis at that time as well but as we we're investigating that system i would be looking for indicators that they've pivoted off that system so did they just compromise this one system or did they spread? If they've spread, then you just keep pulling at that thread and keep following it from system to system until you end up with an entire scope of these are all the systems I know that they're in and these are all the different ways that they've compromised them. So now we need to come up with a plan on how to remediate each one of these systems, deal with all the vulnerabilities within each one of those systems and then bring them back to a, uh, a more secure state. So when you're talking about incident response, it's um, detection, assessment, um, analysis, containment, remediation, and then uh, post-mortem are the steps that we would go through. So if someone tells you that they've got a problem, um, you assess how bad the damage is, do some kind of containment, um, to prevent the, the problem from getting any worse. Your analysis and figure out what's wrong with the system, um, how they broke in, those sorts of things. You come up with a remediation plan, how to return the system back to a more secure state. And then your post-mortem as you figure out what the root causes were, how you can do things better, how your process worked, those sorts of things. Uh, it's kind no, of a long no, answer, but... No, I've talked before, but okay, once we get them back to that secure network, yeah. We don't necessarily want to deal with a break fix every time they call. How do we maintain that clean, secure network? Um, to do something along those lines, um, typically um, you would end up with a bunch of policies, procedures, and guidelines, right? So um, you're coming out with some new systems. You should have some kind of standard wrapped around this is how we deploy a system. And this is how the, these types of operating systems are hardened. Um, policies would cover things like patching, um, separations of duty, uh, not sharing accounts, those sorts of things. So it's a whole whole range of things that you would put in place in an information in an entire information security program that would allow you to deploy secure systems, maintain them, and keep them from um, having these types of issues or actually manage them um, in, a, in a way that is an acceptable risk level to, to the business. And that's really what it boils down to is how much risk is the business willing to accept? If they're willing to accept every single risk in the world, your job's pretty easy. You just sit back and watch YouTube because, you know, there's nothing for you to do. They're letting you, you know, they're letting everybody in and, and they don't care. Um, so. Does that provide enough information? I mean, that's kind of a much wider discussion around I know, I'm just trying to running an entire information security program and all the pieces that fall into place. And just trying to get your logic. Yeah. Okay. Is anybody else? Yes, sir. When you when you talk about defense in depth being medieval or dead, um, yep. are you coming from the perspective of it's dead, so don't waste any time on it? Or are you saying that it's medieval it's not enough take it much farther like you were talking about it's not enough take it much further i mean i'm not telling you to take all the door locks off your doors and leave your windows open at your house right you still need firewalls you still need ids's um but you need to move from the mindset of you know i've got this great wall i've got a you know i've got a moat around it i've got a gate and i've got a guard at the front door so that's all i don't need to worry about anything now i'm all set it's, that's really not the case. You kind of need to expand away from thinking that, you know, I have these things in place and everything's fine to the realization that you actually have problems within your network and you need to go, you need to spend more time looking for those after you get this hardened perimeter set up. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.